So um, welcome everyone. I'd like to say thanks for joining us for our second boot camp. And so you either hopefully watched the first one or were with us um, live for that one. Um, today we have with us Chris Dykus. And Chris, I have your new official title. Let me go pull it up. So Chris is a senior, senior, senior systems specialist uh, with OCIO Customer Solutions. So we've had some rearranging of folks, so that's why I can't remember his title. Um, so he's going to talk with you today about the next step in, in video, so some of the editing kinds of things. And he'll also demonstrate, for those of you that are in research services, at the end, he'll go ahead and give you a tour of our studio space in Worcester. So Chris, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Um, if they have questions, do you want them to interrupt you? You want them at the end? However works for everybody. I'm okay. So I'll watch the chat box. I'm going to probably shut off my webcam here and eat a little bit of lunch during our Lunch and Learn. But I'll be here. Well, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, anyway. I'm Chris Dykus. Uh, a little bit about my background. I've been here with the university for going on 22 years now. Um, I was in marketing communications for most of my career um, as a video producer. I'm now in IT and I kind of support the studio spaces and and so this is going to be kind of a hybrid about how to shoot a little bit, how to edit some things to think about as well as a, just a, a nuts and bolts demonstration of what's in the studio and kind of how to use it. So there's our overview. I'm going to touch on some of the things that Danae has had, had led in with and kind of tie in what she did with the middle stage, which is going to be production, and then kind of give you some setup and lead into what Valerie's going to do next week, which is more on post-production. So let's start with our studio overview. So we now have two studio spaces. We have uh, one of them, which is in 264 Cotman Hall, which is available for use. And we also have one here in Worcester, which is Research Services 130B. So while they have some similar capabilities, there's some different things between the two of them. So this is a, an image from inside Cotton 264. So one of the things that we have in here is we have four pull-down backdrops. Um, we have a uh, branded CFAS college backdrop. We have a, a molded gray backdrop, which is like we would kind of see in a photo studio. We have a green screen. And eventually, which we don't have it in yet, but we will have a, an OSU non-college, but just an OSU branded backdrop. So various things to do. In the ceiling, we have a we have three point lighting set up. So we have three lights, uh, and I'll cover three point lighting a little bit later, or just the basics of it. But uh, we have two lights which will illuminate the backdrop, and then we have what's called a key, a fill, and a backlight for whoever's sitting in the chairs. Um, we have prop furniture. We have a, a standing high table with two high chairs, which you can see in this photo, and then uh, we also have some more like office chair type designs. So the main differences, though, in Common 264, our, our shooting equipment is an iPad Pro mounted on a podcaster set up with uh, an external microphone. So all the recording in 264 is done with this iPad. Um, and then we have an iMac in the back, which you can take the footage off the iPad Pro and then uh, transfer it to the computer and then upload it to Box, which is how they're how we're dealing with the storage. Um, I think at some point in the future, and I'm not sure if this has been implemented yet, is that you will be able to check out this or another adcaster to be able to do some field shooting with. So then we get into Research Services 130B. Um, this was designed before we designed the Cotman, so we have a little bit of different features in here. Again, we have the same four backdrops. Uh, we have the same lighting setup. Um, in this room, we have a device called the Pearl, which is a hardware recorder. So we have cameras mounted on the wall. You can see up here in this photo, hopefully. And then, uh, so basically the system that we, was supposed to be a one touch, but we've got it up to about a four step recording process for you to be able to initiate your own recordings. There's two microphones, two lavalier microphones that you can put on and so you can conduct interviews up to two people at a time currently. Um, we do have some microphones on order that would enable us to do more people. Um, 
currently the 4-H is using this room about once or twice a week. They're doing some podcasts and some 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 YouTube broadcasts, so they're recording these in here. Um, one of the things that 130D has that 264 does not at this time is the post-production suite. So we had a, a PC in here that uh, huge amount of RAM, very good video card, and we're running the Adobe Creative Cloud Suite in here. So with our with our new way that we use this in the colleges, now everybody at the university is entitled to two copies of Adobe Cloud. Um, you would click into the app and sign in, and so you have the whole suite available to you as a faculty and staff member. And some grad students also have this on some case-by-case -case basis. So and you, you are enabled to use this for personal use as well. So if you, you can put this on your computer at home, um, just the, the limitation is you can only be signed in two places at one time and it will tell you if you exceeded that and ask you to sign out. But in case, if you don't wanna worry about running this on your own hardware or your own laptops, we do have the, the, the machine in here to actually do this. Um, next to that in the picture that you can see in the corner is a a high quality podcasting microphone with a pop screen on it. Um, so we have a little soundboard there next to the computer. So we're able to record podcasts and do things directly out of, out of this room. We have a second PC over there as well that we have this set up for lecturing. So if you want to run your PowerPoint on one screen, you can set up a situation where you can have a picture in picture and just record lectures and you can record that straight out. Um, there are more advanced things that we could do with the system, but you just need to let me know what you want to do. And we can we can change some settings inside the device so we could shoot in 4K if you'd like or higher. Um, it's just a matter we just don't offer that in the generic setup. And so, and then again, the the big thing about this room is what we're calling the four-step recording. So, you go into the studio. For those of you that can't see the studio, um, we have a an iPad touchpad in there. And so it will basically come up with this screen, which is whether you want to use this as basic or advanced. Basic is just basically camera, recording a camera only or recording a PowerPoint only. Um, so those are kind of the two options there. Advanced, you get this screen. So we have with a single camera recording, we have a multi-camera recording, and picture in picture and green screen. So Single camera recording is what most people use. It's just recording like a headshot or people talking. Um, picture in picture will allow you to select a second source like the PowerPoint to put up over your shoulder or in the lower corner. Green screen, the actual device in the room will actually do green screen for you. Um, it's limited and it's quality just based on the device that it is. If we recommend if you want to do really good green screen, to just record single camera on the backdrop and then take it into After Effects or Premiere and do your green screening there because it'll give you a much better result. Um, Multi-camera is something that we kind of set up for, for video interviews. So basically what this does is you can put one camera as a close-up on one person, a second camera as a close-up on the second person and conduct an interview and this will record those images simultaneously. Um, this also separates the audio out so that there's audio with camera one goes with camera one. So when you're editing in post-production, you can isolate audio from one microphone over the other. And it's really the most advanced thing that we have in there. So at least at first, let me know when you guys are going to do that. And I could be there to help you run through that. So after you've selected your mode, it comes up to the frame your camera page. And there's pan and tilt control, zoom in, zoom out. And there's a couple presets that are in there which we've set up to kind of be where, where the furniture normally is. Um, you hit done, let's press to record, and then you push this button, it counts down from 10 to give you a chance to get back if you're by yourself, and it starts recording. And then when you're done, it asks you if, you, if you're complete, if you're complete and say you're done, it just tells you to insert your USB drive, and there's a little 
docu station on the top and we provide a USB drive in there. So you plug that in there and that will dump the last of your recording directly to that hard drive. And you can take it and do what you want with it. There's a computer in there if you want to put it up on Buckeye Box. Um, the, the end goal is to have multiple hard drives in here so that we can check them out if you want to take it back to your office and work. Um, the drive is not fast enough to edit from, so you do need to copy it somewhere. I also want to make sure we're keeping it. And we'll go through once a semester and we'll, we'll do some control because we only have limited space in there, so we want to do that. So uh, we now have the scheduling page here, which is for the studio. Uh, if you guys have used this before, this used to be called ETS, which was Educational Technology Services, which no longer exists. Um, so we now, we're calling this Technology Enhanced Meeting Spaces. So CFAS TEMS is the actual go.osu.edu link. So once, once signing in here, you'll see a bar across the top that says Recording Studio, and the website here, and the picture on the left here, you can see that kind of the pictures I just showed you and capabilities. Um, there will be training. I'll probably post what we're doing here today and I'll put that up there on my website so you guys can review what we talked about if you need to. There's going to be some more advanced technical training that will go up there about how to use certain things. Um, if you want to use the studio, you click on Schedule Studio button. And it's in red, it's kind of hard to read. It's on the right side of the page. Um, and then it brings up a recording request form. There are stu under studio locations, those are links to our public calendars that can show you what's in there. So if you need to schedule it. Uh, once you submit this page, it will let us know that you want to use the studio and where you want it. There's now two locations in there. Um, so you can choose whether it's common or, or research services. And that'll just send, right now it's only sending me a prompt and I can look at these and say, just so I can kind of manage things. We've never turned anybody down for one yet, so. But that's kind of the, the run through of the studio and the spaces that we have here. And then just maybe take a quick break right here. Does anybody have any questions about this so far? And I will, um, this is Dina, I'll email out that link to all of you with the recording as well. So you'll have that URL that you can bookmark. Okay. So I kind of want to get into, um, we've talked about, Danae did a very good job last week of talking about uh, pre-production. Um, I want to talk about mostly post-production and I'm going to kind of set up for Valerie to take over next week with post-production. Um, so my main thing when we're talking about pre-production is design with the end in mind. Okay. Just, just to recap some of the stuff that Danae told you, but you want to know your audience, you want to know who you're shooting for, you know, what kind of length this is going to be, is it going to hold people's attention, you have a captive audience, um, you can probably feed them an hour, they can't go anywhere. Um, but typically five to ten minutes is what our attention spans take these days. Um, and we want to talk about style. Is it going to be talking head? Is it going to be you know, lots of action? This is just kind of one things that you want to plan ahead of time. And again, she talked about storyboarding a lot and shot lists. Um, one thing I wanted to add, you know, if you're not an artist, a shot list is good. Nobody expects you to be like the ones on the left. Um, mine kind of fall in between those and the one in the middle, but depending on your artistic ability. But all you really need to do is just write down what you're shooting to make sure you got it all. And the last thing that I put on there was coverage. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that term, but in editing, you want to have coverage. You want to have way more footage than you're ever going to use in your final because you can't go back and get it most times after you've gotten to the post-production stage. So there's a Rumor that uh, Steven Spielberg shot the opening scene of Forrest Gump like 362 times to get the feather to fall in the right place. And then they finally got frustrated with it and just did it in CG after the whole thing was over. But uh, Spielberg was known for shooting, he had like a 20 to, 20 to 1 shooting ratio. So 
just kind of think when you're putting your story together, make sure you've got enough variety, make sure you have more take than one. If you're going to do a pan or a zoom, just make sure you get a couple of those. Just make sure you get the one you like. Kind of call it bracketing. Let's bracket the speed. Do one faster than you want, one slower than you want, because you never know what you're going to need when you get it in there. Um, the other thing is, know your equipment when you're planning your project. You, you could be shooting on a DSLR, you could be shooting on a high-end video camera or your cell phone. Just make sure you know what features you have and make sure they do what you need it to do before you go out in the field. Um, check, your, check your ports. Uh, we had this problem with the Padcaster originally that it uses the, the analog uh, connector. Um, our very first attempt at it, we plugged it in, it snapped the tip of the headphones off inside the jack and uh, right before the day before we needed to do it. And so if we'd had something else that would have used lightning, we could have been able to accommodate for that. So we had to just rely on the fact that we thought we were shooting audio because we couldn't hear it and we had no way to monitor it. So check out what ports your, your devices have, make sure you have the proper cables to go with them. Um, make sure your battery's charged. Most cell phones, you don't have an option of having a second battery, but you can bring a charger with you. And if you're using DSLRs, make sure you have enough SD cards or storage media to record these things on. Most most phones now will shoot in 4K, but most phones now have like eight gigabytes <coughs> of storage in them. So that's like three shots at 30 seconds a piece, and you filled your card up. So make sure you got the settings right as well. Um, I just throw this in there, carry a grip bag around. A grip is a Hollywood term that just basically means you move stuff around. Um, so with the name is stuck. It used to be the people that actually gripped the dolly and pushed it. So that name just stuck. So things you want to have, gloves, lights are hot. Now that we're in LED range, um, not so much an issue, but when we're using the old tungsten lights, they could get several hundred degrees. Um, gaffer's tape, it looks like duct tape, but it's not. It's actually black, and it's actually designed to not stick really hard to things so that you don't pull paint off of stuff when you pull it off. Um, make sure you have a screwdriver, a multi-tool, utility knife, anything. Uh, C47s, again, this Hollywood background, these are actually clothespins. They're used to attach things to lights. lights. Um, and the reason that we use is they're wooden and they don't melt or catch on fire quite as easily. So it says LED flashlight, but any type of flashlight that you have, just in case you need to be pulling wires or doing something that you didn't expect you'd have to do on scene. Sharpie, which is a permanent magic marker, just to document things and then bring as many spare things as you can carry with you, especially if you're out in the middle of the field, which are can you've been in situations where there's absolutely nothing around. Um, we've been in situations where we didn't have enough power to run the lights, and so you always know where the fuse boxes are if you're shooting in a place that's not familiar to you, so things like that. Um, that's kind of all I had to add for production, pre-production, and let's just go into production a little bit. Um, so let's talk about some considerations. You know, in the, when you want to shoot, you want to choose your location properly. Um, so here's some advantages. If you want to shoot inside, you have more control. You're not as dependent on the weather, but everything's going to take more time to set up. You got to put lights up. You got to you got to light everything because it's not going to happen on its own. If you're outside, lighting's usually pretty much taken care of. You might want to use a reflector or something to augment that, but at least you know the sun's going to be kind of reliable. Um, but then you got to deal with weather. Is it gray? Is it going to rain on you? Is it windy? But the advantage here is it takes way less time to set up. Um, I've seen some interesting interviews that were done where they shot it next to the fan at the granary. And then you don't have a camera here because the fan home's in there. That qualifies under fix it and post. And I can talk about that a little bit later. Some things we could do with that. Um, your, your cameras are your phones. So we want to talk about automatic settings. <coughs> Again, less control, but easier to use. You just point it at something and you shoot and you get what you get. Um, 
If you go into manual settings, you can have way more control over your imagery. Um, I have a I have an app on my phone which is called Filmic Pro, which enables me to get into some very interesting settings. I can change color profiles, and do auto focus, auto exposure, some stuff that my phone doesn't have normally. That was like about a twenty dollar app. Um, but then the new version of my phone has all that stuff built in now, so things are getting higher. So obviously you have a higher learning curve. You got to remember that you want to. You got to remember to focus it if you're going to take it off of autofocus. So maybe take a situation where you're shooting somebody and people are running in front of you. If you're on autofocus, it's going to keep trying to adjust that. So you might want to turn that off. But then again, you got to remember that you turned it off. Turn it back on. Um, I, I never shoot in automatic unless it's something I'm afraid I'm not going to get right away. It's like, uh, I don't know if you guys know Dave Lonas, he's down in Florida today for the SpaceX launch. And I reminded him to make sure he was an auto so he could not miss it while he's playing with the settings because he gets distracted easily. But, so, talk about shot composition a little bit. Um, we're going to talk about aspect ratio and vertical video, which is a very big pet peeve of mine. Um, so here's 16 by 9. This is what we were calling widescreen now. All television now is 16 by 9. Apple's done this lovely thing where they have 16 by 10, which kind of throws us off a little bit in certain situations, but it's usually pretty easy to accommodate for. Everything used to be 4 by 3, so the 16 by 9 is now the standard for most everything we do. And Dean, I'm going to try to play this and let's see if you let me know if we're hearing this. Yep, you're good. This video didn't have to look this way. It could have been prevented. Say no to vertical videos. <laughs> vertical videos happen when you hold your camera the wrong way. Your video will end up looking like crap. <laughs> There are more and more people addicted to making vertical videos every day. It's not crack or nothing, but it's still really bad. There are two different kinds of people who are afflicted with VVS. The first group treats the videos they shoot like pictures. They don't mean any harm. They just don't understand that while you can turn a picture, you can't really turn a video. The other group is people who don't give a sh Vertical video syndrome is dangerous. Motion pictures have always been horizontal. Televisions are horizontal. Computer screens are horizontal. People's eyes are horizontal. We aren't built to watch vertical videos. I love vertical videos! Nobody cares about you! If this problem's left unchecked, YouTube will begin showing four videos at once just to save bandwidth. Leatherboxed vertical videos would be the size of a postage stamp. And it will spread everywhere. Movie screens have always been horizontal. If vertical videos become accepted, movie theaters will have to be tall and skinny. And all the movie theaters would have to get torn down and rebuilt. And by the time they were rebuilt, Mina Kulitz would be old and ugly. And birds will crash into them and die. And we will all get stiff necks from looking up. And no one will sit in the front row ever again. And George Lucas will re-release Star Wars again. The skinny edition. I was never really able to tell the story that I wanted to tell. This is a great chance for me to experiment with a new technology. You're a jerk. Every time a mobile device is used to record video, the temptation is there. Just say no. Say no to George Lucas. Say no to old Mila Kunis. Say no to vertical videos. And if you see someone doing it, say, You're not shooting that right, dummy! So having said that, there, there are uses obviously for vertical video, just kind of, uh, I'm, I'm dealing with a, with a client right now who brought a 30 minute surgery in vertical video and they're trying to, to edit it in a way that 
realizing that they can't see parts of it. They probably just didn't know any better to start out with. Um, so you want to make sure it's covering. Um, if you're going to shoot a rocket launch, a vertical video might work for you because that's where all your action's happening. But just got to remember that when you're shooting it. So um, it's more it's more about uh, shot composition. So wide shots, medium shots, close-ups. We're going to talk about rule of thirds, headroom, and look space. Um, so when you're trying to tell your story, I mean, the wide shots are usually used as establishing shots. They can also be used to convey, you know, the whole environment around you. I don't know what my age range is here, but the Lawrence of Arabia is, is known for having extremely wide shots. Um, they're also using extremely telephoto lenses in that movie, but they were trying to establish the loneliness of the desert, so they shot a lot of it very widely. Medium shot is typically defined as head to torso, um, and they can vary in ranges. Close-up shots are typically defined as top of the head to the bottom of your head or the top of your shoulders. Um, so each one of these is going to tell a little bit different, uh, convey a little bit different of emotion. Um, so we have the rule of thirds, which basically says that uh, you divide your screen up into thirds, horizontally and vertically, uh, and, and that it's more pleasing to the eye if, if a, something is not directly square in the middle, but on one of these third lines. Um, people kind of attributed to the golden mean, saying that there's a, there's a specific way it just looks more appealing to you. Um, if you're going to shoot an interview and the person's directing, directly addressing the camera, you want to maybe not use rule of thirds and have them centered up. Typically when we'll do interviews, we'll have somebody on that third line and they'll be looking off screen to an interviewer, which is another style that you typically see. Um, you have look space and headroom. So headroom is the top of the frame to the top of your subject. Look space is from the left, you know, where where you're where you're looking, how much how much look space you have. If you cut that off, things will people get really agitated and really kind of not realize it. It's almost a subconscious thing. You just want to have enough room. Horror movies take advantage of this quite a lot and cut off your look space and your headroom. And so your brain doesn't know what's around the person and it kind of creates a little bit of suspense. Um, you get into creative shots. You have low angle shots like we have on the left, which is kind of, uh, you know, it's making this person look extremely more important because you're looking up at them. Uh, if you do a high angle shot, you're kind of diminishing the importance of the person that you're shooting. So you want to try if you're shooting an interview, you are trying to make your client look good. You might not want to use a high angle shot like that. Um, we have what's called the Dutch angle, or which is just throwing slightly rotating things, just throwing them off balance. It's typically used to throw a user, throw a viewer off balance a little bit. We have the over the shoulder shot, which is uh, this person is talking. You can see that she's obviously talking to somebody. Um, if you guys are familiar with the Cohen brothers uh, that write a lot of movies. They will never shoot dialogue with an over-the-shoulder shot because they feel like you're. They want you to feel like you're, you're the other person that the actor's addressing. And when you put an over-the-shoulder shot, it makes it look like you're kind of, you're kind of eavesdropping on them a little bit. So it's a technique that you can use to your advantage. Two shot obviously is both people together. Uh, we also have what's called the bird's eye shot, which is extreme high angle. Like, one on the bottom right. So um, again, these things provide different emotional responses. So the one on the left is a scene from the movie Blade Runner. This is how the movie opens with an extreme close-up of the eye. And uh, if you guys have seen the movie, you know that's incredibly significant. I won't go into that, but that's kind of jarring for a viewer to see an eye that close and to open up with that. That's going to provide you a different experience. Um, these other two are from a show called Mr. Robot, which I don't think is on the air anymore. But in the middle scene there with Christian Slater, they're kind of, uh, he's being, he's being enforced in doing something that he doesn't want to do. So with each independent shot, they kept cutting off his split space until he got down to this final shot. And that's the moment where his character realizes he doesn't have any choice but to do the thing he doesn't want to do. So they use this camera 
sequence of camera shots that kind of show how you start to feel closed off and trapped. So it kind of, that's an example of no look space for an emotional effect. And then on the far right, we have the another over the shoulder shot, which is designed like somebody's spying on them. So that whole conversation was shot like that. So it provides you again with a different emotion. Inattentional blindness is another thing you got to be careful for. This is one of my favorites. Um, they did a film study here on the left about where your eye works and your brain can handle a certain number of things at one time. And so this person took this picture of this, he wanted to take a picture of this cactus, but he was so focused on the exposure, how he was going to take that picture properly that his brain didn't even register him so that those power lines were in the front of it. So you kind of got to take a step back and look. Um, the one in the middle was obviously done intentionally, but there's a lamppost behind President Obama. And so they framed that shot to look like he was holding that orb. And then the one on the right is my favorite. This is from a dedication to a new fountain. And obviously the, the guy on the far right of the frame is not doing what it appears he's doing, but he just happens to be composed. So if you're, if you're shooting the dean or the president of the university, you want to make sure you don't ever put them in a situation like that. Careful. <clears throat> uh, if you're shooting stills and you're not shooting video, one thing, a trick that somebody taught me one time is you could turn, turn the camera upside down and it forces you to, forces your brain to get out of this comfort zone and actually look at the composition instead of identifying, yes, those are people, yes, those are objects. Obviously, you can't, well, I guess you probably could do that now with video, just with the effect and flip it the right way, but I wouldn't recommend you shoot your entire video upside down. But. So camera movements are other thing. Um, I'm going to talk about pans, tilts and zooms. Pan is pivoting horizontally. Tilt is pivoting vertically. Zoom is changing your field of view. Think of, think of zoom like uh, cropping a picture in Photoshop. You're not really actually moving your camera. You're just changing how much you can see of it. Um, that contrasts with trucks, cranes, and dollies, which is actually physically moving the camera. And you can see the difference, basically. I don't have time to show you all these examples, but the difference, basically, is you see a change of perspective. So if you're pivoting, you can still you can't see anything different than you normally would. So I can, I can make it look like somebody's moving from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen, but I'm not seeing a profile of the person or still seeing the same thing. If I truck the camera, if I physically move the camera left to right, the perspective changes. So it just gives you a different, different viewpoint. My recommendation when you're starting out is try to minimize using these things unless you absolutely have to until you get the hang of how it works. Um, my uncle was notorious for zooming and panning randomly throughout the whole thing to the point where it makes it look like you're watching Cloverfield and it makes you nauseous to watch because you would never hold on the camera long enough. Um, so steady your shots. Um, handheld is, is effective these days. Um, if you can use a tripod, it's always a good thing to use a tripod. They make stabilizers for phones and cameras and all sorts of cameras. Um, some professional cameramen and steady Steady cam operators actually take ballet to work on their footwork. If you, you can get it down, you can kind of just work on and kind of minimizing the movements. Then we have all the way up to the high end of things, which is a steady cam, which is designed to basically a gimbal, which kind of takes out the motion when you're moving. It allows the camera to move independently of you. Um, I said you can do anything. Um, we used to use a dolly in film school. We used to deflate the tires on one of our cars and push it and use the car as a dolly. Uh, you, know, you can do that with carts, wheelchairs, anything you can to get the camera movement. Um, just bundle up your jacket and kind of kind of wedge it under your elbows when you shoot. And that kind of that can kind of deaden some motion. It's never going to be perfect, but. These are just ways you can do it. If you can brace up against something when you're taking a shot, go ahead, because it'll help you stabilize a little bit better.
Well, then we cover lighting. Good. Any one of these can really be an hour long session. So I'm trying to give you as much information as I can in this time. Um, just want to talk about lighting conditions, hard light versus soft light, exposure, three point lighting, white balance, color temperature. Um, so you can take a look at the picture on the left versus the one on the right, and you can see the differences. Hard light's going to be a really, really harsh shadows where the one on the left is, I'm sorry, the one on the right is softened a little bit. We can do this by pushing what's called a diffusion material in front of the lights. Um, there's specifically designed stuff that will just soften up the light a little bit. And there's specifically soft lights that are made that you can buy as part of kits that do the same thing. If you're shooting in the sunlight, obviously you're going to get a little bit more harsher light. If it's a direct, if it's a cloudy day, it might look a little bit more like the right. If it's a bright, direct sun day, it's going to look like the left. So you can get a just basically, basically a piece of white foam core, and you can use that to kind of soften out the shadows on one side of the person's face. Or you can, uh, they make specialized reflectors and things like that that can kind of help out with that. <clears throat> so I want to talk about exposure um, and backlight. So obviously if you shoot into the sun, you're going to have a backlight situation. This would be a time where you would want to take, take your camera off of auto if you have no other choice but to shoot it like this. And you want to kind of maybe bring that up to the point where it may make the sky like really bright, but at least you're going to be able to see the person that you're shooting. Um, nobody wants to watch an interview like this for a significant period of time, unless you're trying to hide somebody from the mob. In case you might want to do that on purpose, but um, then you can see on the on the right, their basically exposure is is <coughs> depending on the on the quality of your camera. Your eye can see about 15,000 different bars like that between dark and light. So what you're seeing through your eye and what you're going to see through your camera are totally different. So this is a very poor camera because it's only got five stops between the darkest point and the lightest point. So, but you can see what, what happens when you start to overexpose things and you start to underexpose things. These are some things that to a little, to a, certain degree we can actually fix after we've shot them and bring them back into Photoshop or Lightroom and, and make some adjustments on them. The other thing too, if your camera has, if you're shooting stills and you have a raw feature, it's going to recapture more data than just in regular mode. So if you ever get into a situation you can shoot raw, you have way more control of your image when you get it back. But if you're just shooting on your cell phone, it's not going to be the same way. Um, so just keep in mind how your exposure works. And again, the, the auto exposure is going to, the way the auto exposure works is it averages out all the, all the points in the screen and it tries to make everything a neutral color. So if you get into a situation one on the, like the one on the left, you're going to want to turn auto exposure off and try to adjust it. It may look like, may look like the last two on the right on the second photo. But at least you're going to be seeing your person better. Um, so three-point lighting, this is what we have in the studio. Basically the, the concept here is you have a key light, which is your primary light source, and then you have a fill light which fills in those shadows, and then you have a backlight which separates your subject from the background. So you can see in, in the main picture there, the animated guy, that's what it looks like all together, and you can take a look at each of those three things. So a key light with no fill is going to be look very harsh. Um, <coughs> and a little light will add in the fill in some of those shadows and then the back light. This is also called a rim light. It will um, kind of just give a little halo around the person. And we talk about white balance a little bit. So white balance. When you have a lot of white balance, it'll try to take all the samples of all the colors in the scene and it'll make it white. So daylight's going to be blue, indoor light, tungsten light, LED light now is going to be orange. So again, with auto white balance, this is taking care of this for you. But if you want to get into manual mode and play around with this a little bit, um, you have a visible light spectrum. Any light that you have, the lights in here are slightly 
on the orange side towards the middle or fluorescence in here. Um, if, you, if you train long enough on it, you can actually kind of see this kind of, it's kind of something you just have to pick up by perception over just the time of doing it. Um, they used to have, well, this still is, and it's sunset, the hour right before sunset is called golden hour. So back in the early days of film, people used to shoot the, the warm, fuzzy, happy shots. They would always try to shoot them in that hour. Um, so it's like, now we can kind of do that digitally, but before, so as the sun sets, things get more orange. So I'm a fan of the Star Wars trilogy, Empire Strikes Back, any Imperial scene they would shoot during the day when they had blue light, and any Rebel scene they would shoot towards the evening when they would have warmer light, and they kind of did that as a subtlety to, these are the bad guys, they're harsh, these are the good guys, they're warm. So all that stuff kind of plays into what you're trying to do. I realize for most of our most of our side it's more about content than it is about the creative side of it, but you know, keeping these things in mind where you're doing it will produce a better product. So then we have audio. Um, I forget who said it now, but somebody said that if if you have a bad picture and good audio, you can tolerate that way longer than having a good picture and bad audio. Um, if all you hear is the, is the whining fan in the background and you can't make out what your subject is saying, people are gonna notice that. We have different types of mics. Okay, so lavalier is what we normally call the clip-on one. That's what you're gonna wear sometimes for interviews. We have handheld mics, which is like they use on the TV news. Um, and wireless mics or wired mics. Um, wireless is good in the fact that you don't have to be right up you could be monitoring the audio from farther away. I do remember a shoot that I was on where we had to set up underneath power lines and the wireless microphone just all just picked up the hum from that. Was, we didn't have enough cables to get the person where they needed to get. We just kind of had to play around with that. So lavaliers have a very tight pickup pattern, so they're gonna try to, it's gonna try to filter out outside noises. Whereas a handheld might pick up sound from all directions. So if you have a choice, there's also something called a shotgun mic, which is a very narrow pickup pattern. So it's going to only pick up what you're pointing at. And it has things called rejection ports on the side, which will get rid of the sound coming from behind you or from the sides. It's very good. If you're going to shoot, uh, the, the microphone that we have with the Padcaster down in Columbus is, uh, is a shotgun mic. So it's designed to just focus on where you're pointing it. Typically, if you can do an interview, if you, if you do have a lavalier mic, that's usually the best because it's going to be right up to their voice. Um, where you put the microphone, obviously, is very important. You want to make sure you get it as close to there. It's actually the place that you're supposed to put a microphone is kind of you're supposed to aim it kind of from the bottom lip down to the top of the chest because most of your projection is coming out of this area. So. That's typically a pro tip of where you want to put it. Um, with a lavalier mic, you want to make sure you got the cable tape down so it doesn't rustle when you move it. Shooting on the built-in camera microphone on your phone and the person's like 10 feet away from you, not going to give you as good a result as, as it would if you have an external microphone. Um, Windscreens. This is designed as a little piece of foam that goes over top of the mic and it's just designed to cut out some of the wind noise. They make things that look like like shag carpet down to just little pieces of thin foam, depending on what you need for the situation. Um, if you can, try to set up your shot where, where the microphone's in front of the person and the wind's coming from behind them. I know you don't always have control over that, but that will cut down on wind noise. And your, probably your first consideration would be to make sure that they're lit if you're shooting outside make sure the sun's in the right place according to your subject. And then your second biggest consideration would probably be where you can put your microphone. Um, I threw in a pro tip here, it's called room tone. If we're shooting in this room, if I'm quiet for a second, you can hear the sound of this room, the fans blowing, whatever, whatever's happening in here, even though you may not hear it. So if you're gonna have to edit an audio, edit audio and cut out pieces, 
you're going to want to make sure that you have recorded what the room sounds like with nobody talking so you can fill in those gaps when you're editing. Um, it's very, the human brain really notices when there's absolutely no sound in most of our day. Uh, our brain is filtering out the background noises, but when you get into the realm of television, video production, if it's dead silent, it will be noticeable. So again, room tone will fill in those gaps and allow you to do that. Um, get towards the end here. Um, so just a little bit about post-production. So if you've never heard this fix it in post, um, the term is said a lot. Um, if you're using the Adobe Creative Cloud Suite, uh, we have some couple things like Warp Stabilizer. Uh, you can run your shot on this if you're doing handheld and it's all over the place. You can run Warp Stabilizer on it and it will smooth out the motion and kind of make it look as good as it can. Not 100% perfect, but we'll do that. Uh, color correction. We can, we can change the tones of rooms. If you shot something and it looks blue and you want it to look orange, you can, you can manipulate that in Adobe Premiere and After Effects and things like that. Um, one of the things that I, I saw that Danae had mentioned last week is you want to make sure your visual flow of things. So if you're starting out and somebody's moving from left to right and your middle shot's moving right to left, that might cause a little bit of confusion. So you can use video effects to kind of flip the shot. Be careful when you do that that they're not wearing t-shirts with lettering on them because then that will become fairly noticeable. If you look on the, uh, the movie the DVD box for Top Gun, they thought Tom Cruise had a better slide and they flipped the shot. The only problem is Top Gun spelled backwards on the bottom of it. I don't know if anybody ever notices that, but that kind of made it to print. So that comes into an inattentional blindness where you're not paying attention because you're thinking about something else. Um, Adobe Audition has some tools in it called noise reduction. Um, again, these work okay. There's situations where they work really great, and there's situations where they make you sound like you're sitting inside of a tin can or something like that. So it's kind of basically what it does is it allows you to capture a moment of silence, and it uses that to determine what it sounds like when nothing's happening and it sucks those frequencies out and just leaves you with what the difference is. But you can adjust how much of that you want to mix in and how much did you want to do. So you just have to find the right balance with that. Um, Addition also has something where you can look at the spectral frequency layout. And if somebody's cell phone goes off in the middle of the shot, you can see visually where that is. And then much like you use the healing brush in Photoshop, you can select that and use the healing brush on it and it'll try to its best to take that out and, and leave the background intact. It does a pretty good job but again, uh, my former boss had a saying, which is you can't polish a turd. Um, and so if you want to go in shooting, try to go in doing your best and then fix the accidents, never go in shooting it halfway and going, oh, I can just fix that later. 90% of the time, it's not going to work out right. Um, so I want to talk about editing a little bit. Um, we tried to do this before and, and came to the conclusion that it's really impossible to teach Adobe Premiere in one hour. Um, so I'd like to do some maybe some more classes on that later if anybody is interested in that. But this basically want to talk about editing as a concept. There's a couple things that we're trying to do. All right, so we can edit, we can correct for length. You know, if something's too long, you just chop the end of it off. Maybe you get too much in the beginning, you know, just changing the length of the clip, just tightening it up. You want to, if you're doing an interview, you want to maybe make it start like a second before the person starts talking and just cut out all the talking that's around it. Um, you can actually, with, with Premiere, and we've done this before, is you can, you can trim ums and sentences out. You can kind of make somebody in an interview say basically what you want them to say if you just edit it correctly. But if, you're gonna, if you do that, you want to make sure you have enough what we call B-roll, which is cover footage, to go over top of that. Otherwise, the person's going to be jumping all over the place and all over the place um, I've had a person that, that didn't want to be interviewed, and they would just give us yes or no answers. And then when the camera was turned off, they would 
actually talk. So we're actually able to take that and <coughs> rather than not saying anything to make it look like they did a good interview, which they later thanked us for and didn't realize that they had done. Everybody says alms and pauses a lot more than they think they do. If you're going back and especially if you're looking at yourself, you're going to notice that. So one tip when you're editing is understand that most people accept that. It doesn't have to be 100% perfect, but... Um, so the other type of editing is, is creating new meaning from different shots. So we don't do a whole lot of this in an interview scenario, but take a bunch of shots that are maybe unrelated and you put them together and it kind of creates a meaning. Um, and the person that created this, his name was Sergei Eisenstein. He was a Russian filmmaker in the 1920s. And he took a shot of an actor with a neutral expression. He put it next to a bowl of soup. And when people saw those two things together, they, they were convinced. Sorry. They were actually convinced that the actor was hungry. Um, so it's just, you can kind of do that. I mean, you just want to make sure your B-roll goes with what people are talking about. That would be the situation that we would use here. You can fudge it a little bit and people won't notice. Um, the other thing is cutting on action. Um, it's kind of hard to demonstrate really easily, but basically if a person's walking and they're taking a step and they're raising their hips and they're moving, and if you were to cut from a wide shot where you can see their feet down to a medium shot, you want to try to time your shots so that when you made your cut, you want to make sure the person's in the same position that they would be as if they were actually taking the step because then it kind of looks it looks off. But the best editing they say that you can do is one that people don't notice. So it's kind of hard to do. This is a tough one to explain just on a video in this situation, but maybe we could do something later when we could demonstrate that. And finally, the last thing with editing is start, start broad and, and refine. Um, they have a policy which is called a rough cut, which basically you take your best takes and you lay them all together. You don't trim them at all, but you just put them all together and say, this is my layout. And once you have your story from start to finish, when you go back through and you adjust in and out points to make, make it flow so it's seamless. Again, this is a whole, it's probably a 10 week course on how to do that properly, but um, we'll do it. So when you're using Adobe Premiere or Movie Maker or any program, these are all typically timeline based. So you have a timeline, you take resources, you drag them through the timeline, you manipulate them, and then you put out a, a final product. With Adobe and, and most of these, they're non-destructive. So if you take your footage and you import your footage, you make an edit, you're not touching your original clip. So it gives you more freedom to experiment. Uh, so basically all Premiere is doing is, is telling you it's telling the computer where to start pointing to that file, where to stop pointing to that file. So you're never actually, when I was in college, we edited on film. So we had one print of our film. So if we cut an extra frame off, that was it. We had to take it back on or you had to start over. Uh, when we got into linear video, once you made where that endpoint was, if you wanted to change that, you'd have to change everything from that point on. So the good thing about editing on a computer is all nonlinear. You can you can work in the middle. You can decide to work on the end. Um, but that's basically the essence of that. And um, really all I had for today. So if anybody has any questions, happy to take them. Chris, we've got one in the comments area um, from Yvette asking if we are making. I'm here, Yadina. Do you see it? Yeah, I'm hearing you now. Okay. Oh, okay. So we've got a question from Yvette. Um, she's asking if we are making training videos for staff and want to have them available for future use, what platform do you recommend? Okay. Um, anyone that works for you. I know it's not the answer you want to hear. Um, the, the advantage of Adobe Premiere or as a, as a faculty or staff member of Ohio State, you have it available to you. Um, it's not an easy learning curve for Adobe Premiere. Um, Movie Maker 
on, on the iPad and on, on the Mac. It's actually probably the, the easiest one to learn. Then again, if you want to start doing some more advanced stuff, it start to run in a little bit of trouble with that. So I guess it would, I've, I've always been an Adobe person, but then again, I have a film background, so I like having all those features. If I were just starting out and was just doing something simple, I would probably use an iMovie or something along those lines. Chris, we've got a follow-up question from Valerie along those lines. Do you know if faculty and staff have the ability to get Adobe Rush for free? I would have to check. I mean, you can go to the Creative Cloud app that you have, and uh, if it's there, then yes. I, I think it's there. I doubt okay. it. Okay, yeah. It, it is one of the things that you can install. And Adobe Rush is actually, I haven't had a chance to play around with it too much, but it is, it's, it's an Adobe product, but it's way simpler than, than Premiere. I think I've heard Danae talk about it. Valerie, have you used it yet? Hold on, I was turning myself on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, actually Adobe Rush is a really good, easy to use. It can be used on iOS systems and it can be used on uh, PCs too. So next time when we meet next week, I'm going to show on um, the Mac kind of version, the iOS version, we're gonna do um, the iMovie, we're gonna do clips, and then I will show Adobe Rush. So for next week, you guys could, could do me a favor, uh, get some video, whether it's on your cell phone or it's on your, you know, um, your iPad or on your, your desktop. And then depending on what type of computer you have, if you can try to get Adobe Rush at least. Um, I am actually going to teach from my iPad and I have clips and I have iMovie and I have Adobe Rush on my iPad. So if you guys, since we're going to be editing, um, that would be great if you guys could get some video uh, before uh, next week. And Valerie, Amy asked a question. Do you know, um, I'm guessing Amy, this is about Adobe Rush. Does it require Windows 10? Yeah, Amy, I believe it does. Okay. So you, you might also want to contact IT to have your Windows updated. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was going to sh show you guys real quick. Um, never mind, I can't, it's not on here. So if you guys have had your computers updated recently, um, you'll see an Adobe Creative Cloud app showing up on your desktop. Um, if you can't, if you don't have that, you, you should have something on your PC called Portal Manager. Maybe you just search for that, and that will allow you to install the Adobe Creative Cloud app. Again, it will work okay. Adobe will work on Windows 7, it's not ideal. Um, but you do not need IT to come and install those for you. If you're doing them through the Adobe Creative Cloud app, all you have to do is click on the install button. That will negate the need to call us for admin access or anything like that. You can install any part of the Adobe suite without needing us to help you. We will if you ask us, but. Good. Are you done? All right, another one um, from Yvette. Are we able to edit, I'm guessing, our training videos or, or post a bit? Are we able to post our training videos on Carmen or is there a better place to house videos? That's a good question. I don't know a whole lot about the Carmen platform itself. I would Here. assume that any place that you can generate a link to, you could do it. I know, I know people do, I know some of the hard crop classes that we have over in Fisher that they are recording videos and posting them there. So I'm not really familiar with the process there though. That might be audience driven too, depending on who your target is. Right. Might be where you want to store the video. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you guys, there's several options for storing your video. Um, some people use YouTube, some people use Vimeo. Uh, you can also use the box folder. Now, uh, Carmen, unfortunately, um, you're kind of limited in terms of how much storage space you have on Carmen. So there's several different options that are available for um, storing and housing. And it also depends who is it going out to, you know, if it's you know, just your students or if it's, you know, public and things like that. So. 
and I know this will tie in um, a little bit. I think John's going to come next week to talk to a little bit about branding, but we just want to make sure. You can search Ohio State branding, and you can search CPS branding, and it will take you to at least what the guidelines are for those. Um, I think you need to have permission to be able to download some of those resources, but John will have more on that. The other thing I was going to add to, it's really important to put um, captioning for ADA accessibility as well. So we've got some options for that too. Valerie, are you going to talk about that next week or should we mention Yeah, it I'm going to talk a little bit about it because um, a couple of the programs have it within it. Um, and Amy did put on their media site. So media site is the authorized uh, tool from uh, Ohio State. Um, that's also the hosting options. Uh, it just depends on, you know, what you prefer and, and you know who you're sending it out to within the college as well we do have if you guys have TechSmith relay accounts i think we still have a few of those floating around that's another option for just doing some, some quick recording and editing so you've had if you want to you know talk to one of us that'd be fine we can kind of see what you've got and then the options that are best suited for your situation Excellent questions. Anybody else before we break? You guys get back to your normal days. And Chris is going to give those of you in research services a quick tour if you want to walk over to see what is it just across the hall, if I remember right? Yep. Yep. All right. Okay, well, let's give Chris a round of applause. Thank you so much. And the reminder next week we'll have Valerie and I will send you guys out um, the link to the recording as soon as it kind of processes so you can watch your email for that. Oh and um, I will be on Zoom. I won't be doing this in a classroom so just to let you guys know. Cool. Thanks Valerie.